If you can tell me what you want, I can tell you how to get it. The problem with the great majority of individuals is not with their ability to achieve their goals in life, but rather with the failure to understand two factors vital to successful living. The first is to make the decision as to what it is we want enough to give it most of our attention until it's been achieved and to clearly define it. And the second is to fully understand that we have the ability to achieve this goal or we wouldn't want it in the first place. The next vital rule to successful living is to understand that our success is won or lost by our ability to serve others. We are interdependent and it's just as impossible to succeed without serving others as it would be to live in our modern world without others serving us. Our rewards in life will and must always be in exact proportion to our service. It is the misunderstanding of this single law which in my mind is responsible for fully 90% of the frustration and discontent we see around us. In your mind's eye, get a picture of a giant apothecary scale, the kind with the cross arm from which hang two large bowls on chains. One of the bowls is marked rewards, the other service. These bowls will always be in perfect balance. Now, a lot of people don't like this law, if they're even aware of it, but not liking a law does nothing to change it. The basic laws of nature and economics are unchanging. If we're out of step with them, we are, as Thomas Huxley put it, checkmated, without haste, but without remorse. But to those who know and work with the laws, he said, they are paid with the overflowing sort of generosity with which the strong delight in strength. Now there are two kinds of rewards or income. One is psychic, the other is real or tangible, such as money or property. If a person doesn't like his income, all he has to do is take a good long look at his service. The fact that the many individuals in the fields of science, religion, teaching, and so on must measure most of their rewards in the realm of the psychic does nothing to alter the fact that their rewards will be in exact proportion to their service. Look where you will, you will find this law in undeviating operation. Our rewards will always be in exact proportion to our service. Good examples of this are World Book and Childcraft. The fact that your company is the world's largest publisher of reference material is based solely on the fact that its products have found the widest acceptance and have been sold to more individuals and institutions. This is the law then that lies as the supporting structure of economics and personal well-being, so fix it in your mind. All attempts to sidestep or in any way avoid this law will result in frustration and failure. So this brings up the question, if what I want is more than I now have, how can I increase my service in order to earn it? Well, whom do we serve? We serve people. So let's take a moment to try to understand people. The more we understand them, the better we can serve them. I think of an adult human being as a grown child doing his best to play for the first and last time on earth this game called life. The extent to which he learns the rules of this mighty game will determine his success. But right here we run into an historic and exasperating fact. People down through the centuries have, with the most amazing consistency, divided themselves into two groups. One group contains about 5% of any given population. The other group contains the remaining 95%. Neither of these two groups is any better than the other. But one thing separates them. The big group, the one containing about 95% of the people, never seems to get the word, while the smaller group, the 5%, does. Now, what do I mean by getting the word? I mean about 95% of the people never quite understand, emotionally or intellectually, that we as individuals control, to an altogether unsuspected extent, our lives here on Earth. That each one of us is the architect of the structure fashioned by our years. You see, all of us want the same things but only about 5% figures out how to get them. I, I think it's perfectly stated in your World Book booklet titled Opportunity Unlimited. It says, within each of us burn two unquenchable ambitions, to serve importantly and to gain financial independence. Both of these worthwhile goals are within the reach of all of us, man or woman, but according to statistics, only about 5% achieve both of them. Why? Let's look at it logically. Every human being has a tendency to think, act, and talk like those by whom he is surrounded. This is environment, and it exercises an enormous influence on our lives. 
we've already pointed out that 95% don't seem to get the word in life, then it follows that in the case of any given individual, the odds are 95 to 5 that he is surrounded by the larger group. And since a body in motion tends to remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force, that he will continue to conform to his group unless we can do a better job of serving him through knowledge. Here is our largest opportunity for service, and the rewards will take care of themselves. Now, right here, let me restate what we've covered so far. Our rewards, psychic and tangible, will be in proportion to our service. The failure of most people to live successfully is not caused by their lack of abilities, far from it, but rather in their failure to decide what it is they want and understanding that our wants are governed by our talents and abilities, and that we are divided into two groups of roughly 5% and 95%, and that it's the 5% group which is successful. So here, let me give you a definition of success, which to my mind covers the subject completely. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. That is, anyone who knows where he is going in life is a success. At the moment he makes the decision of what it is he intends to accomplish, of what it is he considers a worthy ideal, he is successful. Once this goal has been accomplished, he is again, by our definition, a failure until he establishes a new goal toward which to work. To my mind, this is what we as human beings were intended to do, to go through life from one achievement to another and to finally come to the end of our road here on earth, still reaching, still working toward a new and better plateau on which to stand. For this is to live and live completely, to know as much as we can know, to serve as much as we can serve, to accomplish as much as we can accomplish. Well, since success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal, why are we faced with only 5% who can be called really successful? Because the best estimates available tell us that only about 5% will ever decide upon and define the one thing they want, one thing because we can only do one thing at a time. To my mind, the story of a person's life is the story of a, a quest, a search to which he devotes his life. We know that the happiest people on earth are those who know exactly what it is they seek and set boldly out to find it. And while we're all dreamers, the fortunate ones are those who have found a dream so exciting and worthwhile that they'll devote a part or all of their lives to making that dream come true. But while all dream, by far the great majority, that 95%, never realizes that a persistent daydream is often the point on which we should set our compass, the place toward which it is meant for us to journey. The tragedy is that the great majority shrugs off this built-in direction finder and returns to the wide, visible, well-marked road in life which they feel must be the best road because it carries the heaviest traffic. Well, let's make this point clear. The road in life with the heaviest traffic is not the best road to follow for it is the road of the 95%. It is the road with no more opportunity and with 19 times as much competition. Let me very briefly tell you how I got started on this business of making a study of people and why they wind up the way they do. I spent nearly 20 years looking for the secret to achievement. I didn't know it was older than the pyramids and had appeared in more than 50 million books. It started in 1933 during the last depression for me I was bothered by the difference that existed between what I had been told and what I could see around me. For example, I had been told that man was God's noblest creature and had dominion over all the earth and all its other creatures. I knew this was true, but in my neighborhood the creatures were eating better than we were, and I wanted to know why so many were poor when there was such abundance on the earth. They had no money, but there was still as much as there had been a few years before where it had gone. They had little education, yet education was on every side of them. They had very little food, yet it was raised in abundance. They lived in inadequate and ugly dwellings, yet there were good homes for sale. Well, it was apparent to me that these people didn't have the answer to the problem. They were good people, but they didn't have the answers. Here were people who were discouraged and confused in a world which should have been filled with challenge and excitement. It's true that we were in a period of general depression, but to the thinking individual, this represents another problem to be solved, another challenge to overcome, and to many, it was the thing that sparked their greatest accomplishments. I remember reading something once about discouragement. It was a fable about a devil's sale, and he had his many wares on display. There was the rapier of jealousy, the dagger of fear, the strangling noose of hatred, each with its high price. But on a purple pedestal, gleaming dully in the light, was a worn and battered wedge. This was the devil's most prized possession, and it was not for sale. 
for with it alone he could stay in business. It was the wedge of discouragement. Well, as I remember it, the people in my neighborhood were a pretty discouraged lot. Now, discouragement can only come from one of two things. One, a lack of information, or two, a situation over which we can exercise no control. It is very seldom that we're faced with number two. Almost all discouragement can be traced to a lack of information. If you find yourself falling from the top of a high building, you could justify discouragement. But it can be traced to your having made the fatal step, and that was a lack of information about the law of gravity. When I asked these people why we were in the fix we were in, they did a very human thing. They blamed other people. They looked everywhere for the answer except where it really was, within themselves. These were the 95%. And I decided to find out just what it was that separated the haves from the have-nots, not just in a financial sense, but in every sense. I found the answers in books written by great men. I found the answer in the Bible. Why didn't these people of whom I speak know the answers? They didn't read good books. They didn't read the Bible. Everyone owned one because it was fashionable, like a set of Shakespeare, but they didn't read that either. They were discouraged because they lacked information. They didn't know the rules of this game called life, and they had been checkmated, without haste, but without remorse. They didn't realize that without a goal, an aiming point, we're without purpose or direction. They clung together, feeling somehow that there was safety in numbers, without realizing that in this case, just the opposite is true. They didn't know that if we conform to the big group, the odds are 95 to 5 that we'll miss the boat in life in almost every vital and important aspect of living. To prove this, you need only take a look at human history. Of all the billions of human beings who've lived on earth, all great advances, all great ideas have come from just a handful, a few thousand out of billions. Now how have the people as a group reacted to the great ideas? Every great leader and thinker, from Socrates to the Wright brothers, has been scorned, ridiculed, poisoned, imprisoned, stoned, pilloried, burned at the stake, or crucified. Mankind, as a group, has made a consistently grisly game of tormenting his saviors. Why? Lack of information. Lack of knowledge. It comes from following the wrong crowd. What can we learn from all this as individuals? Two things. One. To amount to anything as individuals, we've got to be individuals. We've got to have individual goals, individual thinking, individual action. And two, we must never conform to the great mass of people. We must love them, help them, for our joy and success will be determined by the extent to which we serve them. But we must never lose our individuality and identity by permitting ourselves to be submerged in this suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. There's nothing wrong with emulation. In fact, it's a good idea. So long as we emulate a person who represents that which we wish to become, but never the crowd, never the 95%. And you know what the answer was, the secret to achievement that I had devoted nearly 20 years to finding? Its pure simplicity had caused it to elude me, just as it manages to elude the majority of the people in any given age. I had been looking for something complicated, something only a mind prepared by years of study could grasp, and I found the answer so simple a child can understand it. In six words, we are what we think about. Our minds, our thinking, controls our destinies here on earth to a degree totally unsuspected by the great majority of people. When you think about it a moment, it becomes so obvious, so clear and simple. Well then, if we become what we think about, and if we can control our minds, we can pretty well tell our own future. And that's the point I want to make. That's what I meant when I said earlier that each one of us is the architect of the structure fashioned by our years. This means that if we're confused about what we wish to become or accomplish, our lives, our environment will mirror that confusion. It also means that if we know what it is we seek, that it will, it must be accomplished. Barring an act of God or a catastrophe over which we have no control, we as individuals can call our own shots for the rest of our lives. We can know what it means to go through life from one success to another, to play life according to the rules and reap the rewards. We can know what it means to have peace of mind and live calm, cheerful, successful lives. You are at this moment the sum total of your thoughts to this point, for there is nothing else you can be. And five years from now, you can be and have anything you set your entire mind and heart upon.